when you have somebody that goes to court and they have a psychiatric problem, they're, they're given a diagnosis that fits in this, this aspect. Well, recently, they added culture-bound syndrome uh, so that, that different cultures have certain kinds of, of um, behaviors that are not understood. They're psychiatric, but they're not really understood. But they have to be included or have to be considered in, in the psychological makeup when people are being tried and what have you. So that, that's what you're speaking of. And, and you're quite right. I mean, <laughs> that's going to be fascinating when that ultimately is developed. Yeah, because very quickly, uh, when you look at psychotic behaviors, for instance, some of the derivatives of that or the causes are so cultural bound. An American, for example, could never understand that. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a pure psychotic behavior, but it is bound by strong cultural views. Let's just call it Hindi, for instance. Mm -hmm. That this woman is a witch. Nobody is going to convince mm -hmm. me that she did not. I saw her, and some of the cases that I have developed, some of the protocols are very fascinating that I think Americans will find ridiculous or absurd. Mm -hmm. But you know, also say, oh yeah, they can accuse you and jail you for being a witch. Mm -hmm. All right? And yet we are combining the Western legal systems mm -hmm. with cultural uh, beliefs that do not make sense. So this is some of the areas that are uh, interested in developing the protocol. Oh, and you're quite right. Keep in mind that they burned Joan of Arc at the stake, at the stake, because Joan of Arc was considered a witch, you know, and you had during the founding of the country in the early years, where they went on witch hunts and they had, you know, it's the well, office, yeah, so James absolutely, sure. So you were quite right. I mean, <laughs> it, it had a long tradition. <laughs> and that James Bowne. Oh, sure. Well, there, yeah, there's, there's a long tradition about that in, in terms of that. I mean, I've, I, I've had patients. That, that are as convinced that they've been victimized by, by what they call, I think it's Hugens is the term, uh, which is a, a, a Haitian word, who's the witch doctor. I think it's Hugens. They throw the bones down, and stick pins, and what have it. They believe that. They have to be absolutely convinced that that is what has happened to them. What happened. So, so th that's fascinating, and, and it would be interesting. I really would be interested to see what ultimately happens as that becomes more codified. It's, it, it's certainly a challenge. It is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is tradition. Mm -hmm. A lot of you talk about uh, cult, but it's really traditional. Mm -hmm. Traditions uh, die hard. Mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. So they never die. No. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any more questions? Mm -hmm. We didn't need to get off the subject. But Fascinating <laughs> speech. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, maybe I can uh, can read, perhaps, if it would be all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This will, if I can stand up, I, I, I think I do a little bit better standing up. Uh, I, I, and I had mentioned, obviously, snippets to give you an idea uh, about the characters in the book. Now, I said there four of them in September. Perry Mott, and many more, and Jones. And there, there's a minor character. I, I won't go into this called Runt. But he would he would really emerge in the seat. So and it is not as much written about him, so I don't but, but let me just read something and it kind of give you an idea of how I write and how I develop characters. Because I believe that you can incorporate history, physical appearance, and psychological development all in the same in the same breath, so to speak. September's mother was not a fool and knew full well that after parties served more often than not for the impotence the loss of innocence of many a naive young debutante. And she knew September, despite her academic brilliance, was, if she was nothing else, a sitting target for the likes of skilled social predators. But September was going to college, and if Dolores Jackson could delay just a little longer what she knew was inevitable, if she could see September well on her way to a full education before she surrendered her virginity to the frivolity and recklessness of love, and she knew instinctively that September was still a virgin. Knew too, and was troubled by the fact that her best friend was not. Her daughter might well be less prone to drop out of school for an early marriage, or worse. And for that reason alone, she had spent 17 years wrapping her only child in a cocoon of social protection, which she knew, as well intentioned as it was, would leave September unable to survive if she spread her wings and flew before she could secure her education. Green eyes notwithstanding, 
She was an exceptionally dark-skinned girl raised in the 1950s color-struck Los Angeles community whose available socially prominent young men offered her little beyond courtesy, formality, and friendship. True enough, she had been a part of Los Angeles' Negro society since birth. Her mother, a prominent member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. Her father, a member of the Kappas, and he was a Mason. And that entitled her to automatic membership in Jack and Jill and Tots and Teens, and a guaranteed sponsorship by the City of the Angels Garden and Scholarship Society of Statilla. The boys who made up September's social set always saw to it that she had an escort to the many activities and social events that she was asked for. And her parents and sometimes September asked, her, asked for them to accompany her. And sometimes volunteering for selfish reasons more often than not, since September was friendly with all of the quote, fine girls that they wanted to meet. She was the little sister they all looked out for. It's just that she was extremely dark. And as far as boys were concerned, that made her a leper. And for the moment, at least, that was exactly the way Dolores Jackson wanted. From the time September entered adolescence, it seemed she was not destined to inherit the striking physical characteristics that had so divided her mother. Where Dolores Jackson was a tall, shapely, buxom woman, September remained a short, diminutive, rail-thin, flat-chested, skinny legged girl. <laughs> Only the haunting green eyes, and Mrs. Jackson was at a loss to explain their origin seemed to flag September any significance in social attention. But she quickly learned to bracket them with cosmetics to enhance their effect. She'd never been an unattractive girl, just very dark and very thin with very strange looking eyes. And when well into her 16th year, there appeared to be no change forthcoming, September's mother had accepted this fact with veiled relief. But this relief proved to be premature. Three months before September's 17th birthday, nature realized its mistake and set about the process of correcting things, almost overnight it seemed. Her breast, little more than enlarged nipples really, suddenly expanded at such a rapid rate, the zeros of one week were obsolete the next. Her hips developed curves that destroyed an entire wardrobe, and her legs took on a definition that high heels were designed for. Her rate of feminine development was so alarming that when the telephone calls from male admirers began to double, Dolores Jackson panicked. That was when she started the list. The list. Boys she considered safe. Boys from highly religious backgrounds or well-mannered boys from socially prominent families that she was personally acquainted with. Boys she felt wouldn't take advantage of September. Especially boys openly known to have an aversion to dark-skinned girls. None of them were saints, of course but she felt some might be more saintly than others. Benjamin Banneker Jones was on the list. Benny Boy, as he'd come to be known, was, like September, an only child. He'd grown to manhood under the watchful eyes of Francis, his school teacher mother, and firm, strict father, Benjamin Senior, or Pops, as Benny Boy called him. Both were intent on seeing their son succeed. Barely more than four years older than September, he'd just graduated from UCLA and was headed for medical school at Harvard. Almost from the beginning, Benny Boy had seen a part of the Jackson family. Both, both families lived in Lamert Park, one of the first neighborhoods to integrate after the war. A well-kept residential neighborhood just east of Crenshaw, soon populated by Japanese and Negroes, the Jones lived in a neat, well-kept single-story house on Bronson Avenue, and the Jacksons in a similar house a block away walking distance. And because Mrs. Jackson taught with Minnie Boy's mother at the same Watts Elementary School, they shared the same transportation, babysitting, doctors, and, and the ministry of Second Baptist Church. The families played bridge together and struggled to get elusive permits for their children to attend West Side School. When Benny Boy's father bought him the used 55 Ford four lane for his drive to UCLA, he saw to it that September had arrived in Everett Lane picked her up from ballet class if her parents could not make it and brought her home from church on occasion. It seemed to everyone who knew him that he was a big brother September never had. Always looking out for her, he was polite, well-mannered, and responsible. And as far as Dolores Jackson was concerned, he had proven himself a boy she could trust. So it came as no surprise when following the City of the Angels Garden and Scholarship Society's formal announcement that September was to be one of their deputies. She signaled to her mother she wanted Benny Boy to be her escort. Dolores Jackson was absolutely delighted. 
She had, after all, allowed her 17-year-old daughter to be his date for Kappa Alpha Psi's annual black and white formal ball and accompanied her and, and had allowed him to accompany her to the annual medical dental, medical dental pharmaceutical association spring dance. As far as September's mother was concerned, her choice of mini boy as an escort to the kitchen room couldn't have been more ideal than if she had chosen him herself. And as September's approaching 18th birthday, graduation and imminent departure from college ushered in the last stages of her metamorphosis from the rather nondescript child to that of an alluring, voluptuous, and sexually captivated <coughs> woman, Dolores Jackson had no reason to think her long-held trust in Vinnie Boy would ever change. But as she was destined to learn, however, nothing could have been further from the truth. Wow. So that, that gives you mm -hmm. some feeling for yeah. September in, in terms of, of what her background is like and, and sort of what's, what's getting ready to happen. Um,